Some films were harmed in the making of this podcast. Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and the Palatial FYC studio, you're listening to For Your Consideration, the podcast featuring roundtable discussion reevaluating the cinematic canon of past masterpieces and modern classics. I'm your host, Dustin Friesenham. And I'm your host, Mike Josic. And a hearty hello to everybody listening to the show on YouTube and iHeartRadio and Stitcher and Google Play and all other superb podcast providers. And if you're one of those people, one of those many people who probably download and listen to the show on iTunes, we would very much appreciate if while you were there you rated and review the show if you're a frequent listener of the podcast thanks for joining us again and if you are new to the show be warned spoilers ahead yar there be spoilers ahead that's the second time you've made that joke <laughs> yar i be forgetful my memory is not so good as it once was you've got the scurvy so this week we are going to be discussing a movie that Another movie that Dustin has been wanting to do for probably since the beginning, and that is the 1927 Fritz Lang sci-fi classic, Metropolis. A.K.A. the film that was first seen in 1927 and second seen in 2010. (laughs) Actually, I do believe it did play, after the Berlin premiere, it did play... Like for a couple of weeks with its full length, which would have been in two thousand or in nineteen twenty-seven, yeah, <laughs> and then it got slashed pretty hardcore. This film has a crazy history in terms of releases. The history is almost more interesting than the film, <laughs> <laughs> and we'll probably get into little bits of that uh, throughout the discussion because it's just you can't not talk about that, especially when it comes to other people's reviews of this film. Or talking about Fritz Lang's process and uh, propensity for cruelty to children (laughs) and other human beings. Especially at the time in history when there were no laws protecting anybody. (laughs) Actually, that's a big uh, thing about this movie in general. I mean, it's pre-code, so... Yeah, there's things that we're going to be talking about when we get to the discussion, but just before we do that, uh, when it comes to movies like this, where there are so many versions and it is a foreign film, we like to just qualify which version we watched. For this viewing of Metropolis, we had the Kino International Blu-ray, which was released in 2010, which is called The Complete Metropolis, and it featured the original 1927 score by Gottfried Huppertz. It also had new translation or new titles that were made up based on uh, the notes from the score and the whole reconstruction. Plus it had the extra scenes with all the scratches from the 16mm print that was located in Argentina. And it had cards to describe the action relating to two scenes that were just irrevocably damaged. They could not throw them in, so they described what happened thus giving you the complete film that had not been seen since its first edit weeks after its premiere and honestly those two scenes the descriptions i was fine with that considering like there was only really five minutes is what they say were lost it's not 100 percent clear exactly on time but they were stored one fifth of the movie <laughs> so <laughs> like that's one fifth that had not been seen since 1927 is added in so that's quite the cut <laughs> well at one point this movie was cut down to 88 minutes and it's like a two hour <laughs> Two and a half, and a half hour, hour film, movie. Yeah. So, like, just imagine. Anyways. I've seen that happen before. A Thai film, Tom Young Gung, became the protector here, and it cut down at least a third of the film, and it was made into just utter garbage. Well, so many of those edits, when things get imported from uh, international markets, we cut out all the relationship stuff and just keep, keep in, like, the set pieces and the action. They cut, like, out the, they cut out the plot. <laughs> they do. They really, really do. Anyways, we'll get more into that as we uh, get into our discussion. Let's roll the credits on this film, and uh, let's get our hands dirty. So Metropolis was directed by Fritz Lang, produced by Eric Palmer. Screenplay was by Thea von Harbu and Fritz Lang. 
based on the novel Metropolis by Thea von Harbu. It starred Alfred Abel, Bridget Helm, Gustav Froelich, and Rudolf Kleinroge. Music was by Gottfried Huppertz, cinematography by Karl Freund and Gunther Rittau. The production company was UFA, and the film was released in Germany on January 19th, 1927. The film currently has a 99% rating on Rotten Tomatoes and was ranked number 12 in Empire Magazine's 100 Best Films of World Cinema. It was ranked number 2 in a list of the 100 Greatest Films of the Silent Era, and the BFI called Metropolis the 35th greatest film of all time. It ranks 36 on the Critics' Poll and 132nd on the Director's Poll on the Sight and the Sound Greatest Films of All Time, which is where that 35 comes from. I don't know why there's that discrepancy. <laughs> Uh, in 2012, in correspondence with the Sight and Sound poll, the British Film Institute called Metropolis the 35th greatest film of all time. And being the 2012, they probably could have actually seen the proper version. <laughs> <laughs> Most reviews and critiques of the film would have been of incomplete and heavily edited versions, so it's really polarizing in that sense, and they're talking about different things. It's, it's really interesting how you could even have those kind of reviews at this point, really. It was super interesting looking at old reviews because, like you said, they weren't based on the complete cut, and so many of them were based on the uh, Pollock adaptation. They hired a, an American playwright to do sort of the rewrite of the film when Paramount brought it over to the U.S. That's the film that so many people have kind of seen. And it was cut down by 40 minutes. <laughs> before the Marauder version in 1984. So the reviews by, you know, like H.G. Wells hated this movie so much. But did he hate this movie or did he hate something completely different? Exactly. If I randomly tore out 50 pages from War of the Worlds, I'm pretty sure a lot of people aren't going <laughs> to like that either. <laughs> and while there are definitely movies that could stand to have some of the fat trimmed, and honestly, this movie probably could have had some of its fat trimmed, but... But some of the fat that was trimmed was like an entire character arc simply because the name was too close to hell. <laughs> so bringing us back to format, <laughs> <laughs> Dustin, this was the first time for both of us watching Metropolis. What did you think of the film? I honestly wasn't even sure what I should expect going into this film. I had no idea what this movie was about. I knew it was about a city. That's about it. <laughs> that there was a robot in it, presumably, since you see that on every single cover. The imagery that we got from pop culture and stuff, like it does not tell you what this movie is about. All you see is the machine the mensch and lightning. <laughs> that's basically <laughs> it. And some trams and a view of the sky. Like that's that's what you have. And certainly And the clockwork people on the machines. The clockwork people on the machines is fantastic. The motion that they do, the the way that the machines work, it's that a light would appear and they've got to move something in that area or move a couple clock dials to that light. And somehow this works the machines. But it works in such a very mechanical way that it definitely feeds into they are a cog in the machine and their movements are are fantastic, especially when you have that wall at the heart. I just, I adore it. I kind of feel like that was Fritz Lang predicting uh, the invention of the Wii. <laughs> <laughs> I've certainly seen a few games at like Palladium that are played exactly like that. Here's a glowing light, slap it! <laughs> and one thing that did live up to the hype was the special effects. I had heard that it was revolutionary, and for 1920 friggin' 7, it's goddamn amazing. <laughs> it really holds up. We were both like, the, the transformation of Maria to the fake robot Maria, the lighting, the, I mean, we know it's all like animated and optical effects and stuff, but like there was that oscillating energy that was going around the body and it was fantastic. It, I'm honestly not too sure exactly how they did that one because it looked so much better than the other stuff. I think it was just animated. I think that was just hand animated stuff. And it was so fantastically done. You can see that a lot of the stuff were sort of uh, matte paintings for the backgrounds. They pioneered the effect that would have people acting in front of miniatures for this film. There's a lot of revolutionary stuff that goes on. And of course, being before code, there's a lot of real stuff that goes on, such as setting Maria on fire on a pyre <laughs> at the end. And uh, let's keep a bunch of kids from the poor section of berlin freezing for two solid weeks in water purposefully left cold <laughs> which really had them running up those stairs kind of fast <laughs> like get us out of here <laughs> and boobs there there are boobs in this movie i was not expecting to see that <laughs> 
a surprising amount, really. <laughs> but again, yeah, it was pre-code, um, foreign film, and it, it was subtle, but it was there. But it was interesting. I, I, I was not expecting it, and it was just one kind of early moment where I was like, oh, okay, this movie sort of draws its own lines. <laughs> <laughs> And then later on, when she's acting as the whore of Babylon and seducing all the men folk, you mentioned the robot that is. Yes, you mentioned the. We'll talk more about that later. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the backgrounds and the like, matte paintings and stuff. And I wanted to shout out to the effects guy Eugene Shifton, who basically lacking the ability to do uh, the effects in post in a laboratory environment with compositing and whatnot actually did the effects photographically using miniature sets and mirrors combining the two which allowed people to you know walk across those walkways and stuff and uh on that's that was on top of a number of in-camera effects that were also performed by cinematographer carl frund when you look at the stuff that was done like i said in camera and then you looked at the stuff that was done with like the electrical effects and i mean this this movie, just on a technical level, I almost think should get, like, the masterpiece <laughs> <laughs> for 90 years ago. And there's so many movies that you watch that you see the effects and you kind of, I mean, it's super, super dated and you can completely pick out all the techniques. And and here it seems ahead of its time, even if you can do the same. Very much so. And it's reminding me a little bit of 2001 last week where, you know, the pen on the window pane, which is so simple, but... It was just such a mind-blowingly perfect effect. Only Anyways. unlike 2001, <laughs> this film has a lot going on in the plot. <laughs> and it's roughly the same length. Give or take. Also, the, the restoration, like, this film looks great. For a movie that came out in 1927, it was so clean and so crisp, except in the parts where, obviously, the film was restored to the best of their ability. But you really get to see the lighting and the camera work the camera work also like there's a few scenes where i don't know if they picked up the camera or just panned it around but they were fantastic little scenes and there was only a couple of them but i adored those camera shots and knowing how big the cameras were back in the day <laughs> i'm like did they have just a galley worth of slaves carrying that camera around to do that <laughs> Well, there were like 25,000 extras on this film, so... Because <laughs> once again, back in the day, you don't have CGI people, you have extras. If you see hundreds of people, it's hundreds of people. Hundreds of people running down that hall, hundreds of people marching in tandem, going to work in the machine levels down below. And while we were watching this, we were commenting on some of the acting, because silent film acting, and this movie is full of it you don't have words you don't have sound so there's so much hyperbolic movement exaggerated if you're showing pain or disorientation you're doing crazy arching and throwing yourself around but there was also a great deal of subtle just standing still kind of face acting and i haven't seen a lot of silent film but it was almost out of place <laughs> but it was fantastic acting at the end, when Maria turns back into the robot form and Grot is there in front of her, just the shock on his face, it's so subtle, but it tells you everything you need to know. And considering what you have been seeing him do up until that point with his dancing, <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's doing quite a merry jig. He's not a dancer. <laughs> <laughs> he would belong at any punk concert, <laughs> that's for sure. He needs to be in the mosh pit. <laughs> oh, 100%. He is the mosh pit. <laughs> but his dancing does not compare to Robo Maria's. <laughs> that was an interesting combination, I think, of the, the hand-cranked cameras of the period, giving that slightly exaggerated movement, and also, I think... It was very Her frenetic. own slightly exaggerated <laughs> movements, yeah. That whole scene, that whole sequence, we're really jumping around here. <laughs> I found it really fascinating because, for one, I was surprised by the hypersexualized nature of it. It was narratively appropriate. But I was also even more taken aback by the reactions of the men in the Yawashara Club, which were very primal and... It might as well have been mind control that she was doing. They were being released of some sort of weird convention... I honestly think that Fritz Lang filmed the first wet dream. Because <laughs> those guys are panting and growling and, like, 
they're they can't contain themselves and they start killing each other for her affection <laughs> which feeds into another whole sort of angle of analysis that I'm going to hold off for a bit but Why? okay let's <laughs> All right, all right, let's just get into it then. So, so much of this movie deals with the head, the hand, and the heart, the sacred and the profane, and the virgin and the whore. The proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Yes, that as well. (laughs) And the relationship between mensch and machine. I couldn't help but feel like the city of Metropolis is basically split into this utopian upper class where the people of intellect and wealth and power live and the people who live below who are the poor and the uneducated and they are the hand they are the builders they are the essentially proletariat the slaves the babies being fed into the machine yeah i know that generally the robot maria kind of once she enters the picture she sort of becomes the ersatz villain of the piece or at least the the main tool of the villain of the piece. But I couldn't help but think of like Huxley's Brave New World, where he basically portrays the utopian society as stagnant. And that's why there's no art or any great art in his world, because there's no suffering. There's no, you know, deep thought. Everybody's just happy. And I kind of feel like even though Robot Maria is supposed to be a villain in the piece, She really shakes things up and creepy as it is for the way that these guys are like ready to just cream in their shorts. She is kind of breaking them out of this monotony, like the way that the people walk, the weird roboticness of all the people and the routines and how the intellectual people who live in the upper city uh, are detached and, you know, they, they just kind of sit around all day and just play and Maria comes out and... I mean, people die and shit gets broken and the kids almost drown and all that stuff. But, I mean, she she is the catalyst for this. She does wake up this entire society. Were it not for the robotic Maria, would Freighter have been able to bring together the head and the hand? I do not think so. If you look at uh, Tarot, the tower card represents how you have to tear down what you have built in order to build it up again from the foundation. Freighter would not have been able to do that himself. They needed to tear down the Tower of Babel, which is, of course, what the tower in the film is named. It's the it's, new. It's the it's new the tower basis of, Babel. of everything. Exactly the new <laughs> Tower of Babel, and even in the old story, like it gets torn down. Granted, for entirely different reasons than they show in the film, Maria does change the story big time. But you have to tear it down to its foundations in order to build again a new and stronger than before. And so the destruction was actually a necessary component of all of that to happen. The change would have possibly been too slow and might have gone backwards had it been just Freighter trying to fix things up. His dad would have constantly been trying to undermine him, for one thing. Which brings into it just a very gray morality. There is no... Which is great for a black and white film. (laughs) (laughs) All shades of gray. There's not a distinct, well, this guy's obviously evil, this person's obviously good. Like, Jo Frederson is the most evil of them all, and Maria is the most good of them all. But most everyone else is fairly, well, and Freider is also very good. But a lot of other people, they're up and down, they're gray, they don't fit necessarily into one category or another. And I really enjoy that about this film. And all of that would have been lost in the edits that they put in. (laughs) But yeah, I find I find that whole thing fascinating and problematic at the same time because while I like the fact that Robot Maria can be viewed almost as a liberating force because honestly, she is the thing that causes everything to sort of happen. She's the catalyst. She's both revered and feared for it and ultimately burned at the stake. This movie does have um you know, to be fair, it was made in 1927, but if there is a problem, it generally starts with a woman. The problem between uh, Jo Frederson and Rotvang, Hell had a baby with Frederson and she died. So that caused that rift there. Um, when it was a love triangle to begin with. The real Maria is the one who is causing the workers to think about other stuff. But she's also praising peace. She's like, wait for the mediator and he will help bring us all together. She's a beneficial force in the workers town. I agree. And this is where I sort of find it to be kind of a complicated thing to uh, 
to parse because yes maria is this force and i I think she is sort of a strong female character who is bringing change in her way to this sort of stagnant i mean the fake maria and the robot maria are kind of the the yin and yang they're the two sides of the coin the one is the you know chaos and, and the other one is order but you still have these two female characters that are essentially playing the virgin and the whore and they're being revered and feared for both and then Maria, uh, just to finish my thought from before, ultimately Maria, uh, Robot Maria, is the one who like brings everything crashing down. So ultimately, kind of at the heart of Metropolis, I feel like, and considering how much of the idea of Metropolis is based on religious iconography, I mean, there's the Whore of Babylon, there's the Tower of Babel. Um, there's the names that people have. There's the, of course, images of the whore of Babylon flying upon her 12-headed serpent. <laughs> There's the Eternal Garden, which was made for the sons to basically wander around and be entertained by half-naked women. There is that heavy religious iconography, which does have a history of, you know, everything basically coming back to uh, Eve fucked us all <laughs> back in the Garden of Eden. But then there is that other stuff, which underpins kind of a, a more positive I mean, you can see a more positive side to what Robot Maria is doing and to what Real Maria is doing. I don't know, man. Am I just going in circles here? I I, I don't see what you're seeing. I don't see it hearkening <laughs> back to women being the fault or to blame, like the Garden of Eden and all that, in spite of religious iconography. What I'm seeing is you have Maria, who's a massively influential force for peace, being corrupted by Joel Frederson who takes her image and subverts it to his own means in order to have the men do what he wants, which is to cause issue so that he can squash them all. It's man who creates all the damage by his corruption of a woman who was the main force for peace. So I'd say, if if anything, that would be what I saw. I'd actually look at this more from a bit of a feminist perspective, given that it was written by Fritz Lang's wife at the time. The other one, the robotic one, as I said, under the control of men, this is what man has made woman to do. This is the only role that men are letting women do. They're immediately taking her, pulling her from her position of power, and replacing her with what they want, which is definitely a commentary on how women are treated. And I do think it's worthwhile to look at, particularly since this movie is so influential, like not just visually, but thematically. And I do agree. And it's, I mean, it's where my sort of internal conflict with the narrative lies. I mean, this movie, like we said, is from 1927. But I just wanted to sort of address sort of that part of the narrative, you know, like it's the Sons Club. Uh, There's so many men in this movie. The head, the heart, and the hands are all male. I was The only women you see are the wives of the workers who we don't even know what the heck they do during their day. And the uh, women above ground who are essentially entertainers for the men. I'm not saying they're not subjugated, just that Maria is not to blame and that fault does not lie upon them. I did find (laughs) it interesting that, you know, in the same way that I'm sort of calling out how the head, the heart, and the hand are all male, typically the female character is sort of appropriated to be the heart because that's the female, you know, I'm doing air quotes. (laughs) That's the female role in so many movies. Talk Um, to Wonder Woman about that. Yeah, I recently complained (laughs) about the, the whole Wonder Woman thing. But yeah, like looking at the movie contextually, uh, I just think it's sort of worth noting. I think it's it's there and I think it's underpinning things. And I think it's apropos for the time period that it was made in. But I do think that there is, like you said, there's a positive angle to it as well. Both for Robot and Real Maria. And then moving from the religious aspects to the social aspects, one thing that I definitely noticed when you had 118.11... Because, of course, why should you bother giving these workers names? He does have a name. He does have a name, but he's called by his designation by the Thin Man. He is. He is. His name is written on the note, though. Or on the hat. Alongside the number, yes. Yeah. But he's relieved by Freder earlier on in the film when he sees him working away at this uh, weird clock machine. Somebody must stay at the machine. And Freder says, yeah, somebody will. You go, go to this address. Meet Joseph at. Just wait there for me. He gets into a taxi cab, sees that he has money, sees a woman in the other taxi, and he's like, shit, I could go to this club and just 
dally with a bunch of prostitutes and spend all this money. That is absolutely what I want to do. Screw whatever anybody else says. He is corrupted so quickly by power and influence. I kind of felt like he was, he's like, yeah, I'm going to go, but this looks interesting. Maybe just for 10 minutes. (laughs) And when he walks out of the club, he's doing the same trudging steps that everybody else did as they're going to work, having to leave their Their shift. Yeah. Yeah. Having to leave. Or as the Germans would say, schicht. (laughs) (laughs) Schicht happens. And at another point, Joe Friederson is talking to Freder, who is relaying this information of the accident that occurs. It's like, why are the workers, like, where where are the hands that built your city? Where they belong. And that's, that's one of the big things right there. That one phrase tells you so much. But they also humanize. They, they, as much as Freiderson is the villain of the piece, being, well, there's multiple villains of the piece as much as Freiderson is one of the main villains of the piece uh, architects of the whole kind of destruction of what's going on they do sort of humanize him a bit when he comes to Rotvang's lab and he sees that big statue of hell and he has kind of a tender moment and there is this push and pull like there is with so many other aspects of the movie where his character he is one of the the brains he is one of the heads and he's less interested in the emotional human side of things he built this city he he specifically tells Rothfang just forget about her like you got to move on kind of like I did when it comes to hell and it was interesting to also note like when Freider comes in and he's talking to Yosefat and we commented on this like so, so many of the human interactions particularly between Freider and, and other characters they're so intimate they start touching and hugging and they get so oh, close. He, you think they're going to start so making close. out. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's supposed <laughs> to play with this idea of, you know, somebody like Jo Frederson, he is disconnected. He is more kind of machine, you know, in the His way he thinks than man. His acting is extremely subtle He's until very cold. the end. He's very cold. Intimate human interaction is something you don't see a lot of. The only time he starts acting like everyone else is at the end when he's worried about freighter what's going on and you noticed his hair changed color at that point as well although he was also t- speaking of josephat and yo freighterson one thing i definitely wanted to bring up was josephat has a weird position in this movie he doesn't <laughs> do too much most of his role seems why is to, it josephat most of his role seems to be to be dispassionately thrown aside by yo freighterson and replaced with the thin man just to show how people are so disposable, replaceable. replaceable. Yeah. And it wasn't and even Yosef his fault. And has a sensitivity, and the thin man does not. It's true. And he... he it gets he was... in the way of his utility. <laughs> Whereas the thin man just does with no thought. The thing is, Yosef was framed, pretty much. Like he... <laughs> Freighter comes in and explains the explosion that happened, and Yo is like, why is it, Yosef that I'm hearing this from my son and not from you. Because your son was there and ran immediately to you. Like, that is how much faster can you get information than that? How would I get the information then relay it to you before that? And then it's like, all right, I'll go get the details. And he brings Grot over to give Yo the details. And when he gets the details from Grot, he's like, why am I hearing this from Grot and not from you? Because I brought him to give you the details. Like... <laughs> It's from the horse's mouth. Why would you want this extra layer of bureaucracy in there? Just... And then he gets fired, and it's... He was going to commit suicide before Freighter stopped <laughs> in him. In the hallway. <laughs> because <laughs> what, the stairs. what does it mean to get fired by Freighterson is now you're stuck in the machine levels. Now you're screwed. You're a nobody. You're nothing. That is the level of economic and social power that Freighterson has as the creator of the metropolis. I definitely feel sorry for Yosef that, And... I that a lot of those scenes got cut scenes at the apartment uh, even the scenes on the stairs when Freighter comes out and gets him to not shoot himself in the head the scenes with the thin man and 11811 who eventually sacrifices himself to save Freighter's life which was pretty much what their relationship was building to to an extent that they'd have faith in him being the heart now that's actually that's probably a good place I mentioned how a lot of his stuff was cut. We mentioned how a lot of Hell stuff was cut. That's a good segue, I think, to talk about the added scenes and how some of these scenes were cut. 
while I could probably pinpoint like a handful of scenes where they were just little reactions and there's enough cuts that you can still understand what's going on if you took them out. You basically lose entire motivations. <laughs> yeah, like I just don't understand. I mean, one of the cuts was the whole idea of this triangle between Rodvang and Frederson and Hell and what that meant and why Rodvang was making this robot. Because if you take all of that backstory out, it really just looks like he's making a sex doll. <laughs> <laughs> Especially at the end when he kidnaps her, like, aha, it's my robot. I'm totally going to bring you back home and <laughs> make sweet, sweet love to you. <laughs> Come on, robot. <laughs> you don't know that that robot was his long lost love that he sacrificed the rest of his life for. He just seems like a creepy King Kong weirdo I carrying do... her under his arm <laughs> on the roof. <laughs> oh, man. When he drops her. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a sack of friggin' potatoes, he man. He's this freighter coming up the ladder and he's just like, oh, I got to fight. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, it's a machine. He can ref he can fix it later. <laughs> I never thought of that, but yeah, it's it's pretty funny, and it also has like that uh, odd speed to it because of the hand cranked camera. So she just goes down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there was there was a lot of like intercutting in that whole final scene with the flood and with uh, robot Maria and real Maria. Basically, you know, back and forth, showing people leaning against walls and parting and moving. I think a lot of that. You know, you probably could shave 15 minutes out of this movie and probably not really feel it. But I also didn't feel while watching this movie that like with the addition of all of these scenes that I wasn't like, oh, my God, this is so superfluous. It didn't feel like a super long movie. It didn't feel like it was dragging at any point in spite of the fast pace, in spite of all the reaction shots, in spite of anything. And when you think of the fact that this is two and a half hours with no dialogue... <laughs> like you're you're literally just listening to two and a half hours of music and doing a little bit of reading and when i say a little bit of reading i mean a little bit of reading <laughs> there's a number of scenes where you'll have just two people having a conversation and there are no title cards to tell you what they're saying but still you understand what's going on and you know what they're talking about that is how well that is put together you'll see characters talking for two minutes and then a title card will come up at the end and it'll be like gotcha <laughs> 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 or yes go do this Something that was commonly done in silent film was color tinting. And this film was completely bereft of color tinting. And I thought that was kind of conspicuous, but I sort of appreciated it because I'm not a big fan of color tinting. But Marauder tinted the 84 version with the pop soundtrack. And apparently it was tints that Lang approved. Uh, I'm not sure if he drew from notes or, or what. I haven't really done kind of any real digging on it so i don't really understand the importance of the inclusion or the exclusion but what were your feelings like how would you have felt if the movie had color tinting do you know what the, have you seen silent films before with color tinting i don't think i've seen that in any of the silent films i've seen uh, I've would that have bothered you if, if you saw it on I'd, this version? I'd, I'd have to see I'd have to see the differences. The only silent films that I've seen are this and one that was made in like 2004 to look like a silent film. Otherwise, even M by Fritz Lang was a talkie. Yes. Uh, we didn't talk about the music. This music was discovered uh, in an attic, I believe, somewhere. They found the original score with the original uh, scene notes for placement, and this is something that actually really helped with the reconstruction. But they re-recorded the soundtrack to the original Huppert's specifications and overlaid it on the film. So not only are you getting the complete film visually, but you are getting the complete film tonally. You're getting the... Sonically, yeah. The, the pacing is the way it should be. A lot of the scenes, they had to change the order they were in because when they were reconstructing it earlier for the second most complete version, they had no idea what scenes went where. So they had to reorganize a lot of stuff. Like, the amount that went into this reconstruction is insane. They're damn near starting from scratch. <laughs> and the sound did exactly what you'd think it would do in a silent film, and it accentuated everybody's emotions. It accentuated the tone of the scene, and it all worked very well. It's... I couldn't re recall a single note of the of the score, but I know that at no point did I feel that it was ham-fisted or that it was eye-rolly. Just it I, all worked very well. I did feel there was a couple of moments where tonally it was very light-hearted, and it 
seem to work not in concert with the scene, but actually in direct conflict with it. But, I mean, there is two and a half hours of music. <laughs> there's, like, no point in this movie where there's no music playing. So those moments, they come and they go. And are forgotten by lesser mortals such as I. <laughs> the only real complaint that I could really level at this film is that because of the restoration, because of the re-recorded score, like, I'm so conditioned to watch an old movie, to still hear it in a monaural soundtrack, to still hear it be a little bit tinny. You know, I've seen movies from the 20s and 30s and... So your complaints are that the technical aspects aren't as bad as... I know. It's, of... <laughs> it's, a, it's a weak complaint, which is why I said, like, this is the only real complaint I can level at this movie. The soundtrack sounded a little too good at times. It was a little too clear. You, you're watching a film that has this sort of visual texture to it, and I felt like the sound lacked some of that texture. But that was just, that's just like cultural conditioning for how I'm used to consuming this stuff. It's not really a criticism level at the film. <laughs> Whereas my complaint would be one of a modern viewer looking at the overacting of the theater actors in the silent film era, especially when juxtaposed to some really subtle acting that was fantastic within the same film. But that is just a matter of time and place and context. And I'm certain that in a hundred in ninety years, because this is a ninety one <laughs> year old film people, in ninety one years people will look back at anything we consider awesome now and be like, What the hell are these people doing with their faces? I do find that you get used to the exaggerated movements quite quickly. It's part of the tone, it's part of the style of a film. I mean, either you like it or you don't like it, but the only time where it actually stood out to me was when Freighter comes in and sees Robot Maria with his father, and he does like that weird dance <laughs> where he puts his arms out and they're doing like the sparks going off because he's basically having a mental breakdown seeing his father with Maria. It's just so hilariously portrayed. It gave me a giggle. <laughs> so if you've got nothing to add let's get into the judgment phase of the show and this is a tricky one to judge for me and i've always said that a masterpiece should stand on its own be something that i would sort of recommend to anyone looking at a movie of that genre but this is from such a different era that does that change how that would work does that change how a modern audience would see it, would interpret it, would look at it. Would you have to have some sort of education and understanding of silent era films to get past the lack of dialogue, the lack of subtle, almost reasonable acting? And most definitely, if I were to say museum piece, it would be at the forefront of that museum. You walk in and here's a giant metropolis thing like this is something that anybody who's interested in film history should look at because there's so much going on. But at the same time, I think it does have so much going on for it that I can't just put it in a museum for that case. So it's a really tricky decision for me. But I think that I will fall off the fence in favor of Masterpiece. That this is a film that 91 years later is worth a longer analysis than we've put into a lot of other films that we've done masterpiece or not that it was so influential even though half of it was cut lost reorganized butchered it is a film that we're lucky that they did keep around and go through all this effort to put back together that it's one that is actually worth doing for well, this was an easy one for me. Like I said at the beginning, I thought I knew what this movie was, and then I started watching the movie, and I was like, oh, I have no idea what this movie is. As it played out, I just, you know, all the things that we talked about <laughs> during the analysis. I mean, this movie has influenced so many other movies over the last 90 years. It's... And it's not even this movie that was influencing them. It was a butchered version. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> its DNA is everywhere. In our music videos, in our films, uh, it's it's just, it's in the zeitgeist. And it has some questionable sexual politics, but I think that's apropos of the period. And I think the fact that it's there, but there are some conflicting ideas in there to sort of make you question it. I mean, this is a thought-provoking movie. I kind of feel the same way about this movie that I felt about 2001, where it's it's visually stunning, it's fairly entertaining, it's really thought provoking and it's it's deep in its themes and imagery and it's just one of those things that i think humans need to experience it's it's a piece of culture it's a piece of art and it's definitely 
a masterpiece. This is, uh, you know, despite the torture that Fritz Lang put people through <laughs> to make this, he's he's a monster. But uh, yeah, this is an amazing phenomenon of a film. It's a masterpiece. If you're going to watch it, definitely seek out this Kino International version. It's uh, it's well worth it. It's the best you're going to get next to a time machine and learning German. And it's a movie that I needed a couple of days to really soak in. I needed to kind of sort my thoughts and ideas and, and do a little bit of thinking about, which that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a masterpiece or museum piece but i kind of neither good nor bad yeah i just i i do appreciate it i mean that's it just supports the idea that it's a thought-provoking film so and and hopefully uh this discussion has provoked some thoughts in you dear listener and if you want to share any of those thoughts feel free to join us on the youtube comments send us an email meet us on instagram twitter our wordpress blog facebook like share subscribe follow spread the word if you like the show. Or if you don't, we're not picky. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take the view. We'll take the share. <laughs> so what do we have on deck for next week, Dustin? Next week we are looking at Alfred Hitchcock's thriller romance, Vertigo. Which is celebrating its 60th anniversary. So, a bit of an anniversary episode. Happy birthday, Vertigo. And I may be stating an early bias, but one of my favorite Hitchcock films. Having seen very few of them, I can definitely say it's at least in my top five. I'm not sure that I've seen more than five. (laughs) 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 Which makes it a very solid case. (laughs) It's not likely to get bumped out. So look for that next week on the show. Uh, Thank you guys so much for joining us. We appreciate all your support. And we hope you'll consider seeing us next week for another rousing episode. And that's it for us. I've been your host, Mike. And I've been Dustin. We'll catch you next time on For Your Consideration. Arrivederci. Guten Tag. You also called it fake Maria and robot earlier, so have fun with that in the editing. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it, Dustin? I'll be the same. That I can't podcast anymore. <laughs> <laughs>